Birds and animals communicate vital information with their howls, squeaks, cries, their growls, and purring. And these are utterances with elements of a story in them about fear, pain, property, and pleasure. But it's unlikely that an ant or a cricket, a cat or a mouse, or a lion or a lamb relate what human beings call stories, that the animals invent plots or attribute thoughts and actions to imagined characters, as did La Fontaine, taking his cue from the oldest collection of fables extant, told in the Middle East as Kalila wa Dimna. Homo narrans, l'homme récit or la femme récit, the human being is a narrator, an ir irrepressible maker-up of stories, a gossip, a reporter, a dreamer, an anthologist, and recycler of old stories. And this capacity is both glorious and terrible, life-giving and lethal, as we heard in the papers this morning. Svetlan so Todorov coined the term l'homme récit, and it's untranslatable because French récit enfolds both fabrication and testimony. Myth is a story held in common, protean, and usually ancient, though there are new variations generated all the time, often claiming they're from old material, but sometimes brand new. The role of myth in history and experience cannot but be equivocal. Myths and related stories in the form of fairy tales and legends and tall stories tell truths and peddle lies. They present improbable situations that test the limits and offer thought experiments about possibilities. They can express the most yearning ideals of the utopian imagination and entrench the most obscurantist righteous bigotry. Like phosphorus, myths need to be marked has chem danger, and they can illuminate luminously and burn like wildfire. Is it possible to speak of the reason of myth as Jean-Pierre Vernard did, and see potential for extending justice, mercy, truth, and understanding in the wild, fantastic scenery of mythology. I was one of those children who'd read under the bedclothes with a torch after lights out, and later, in damp student digs, I'd hug my eiderdown around me while I lost myself in books far longer than I can read now in a sitting or a session over a few days. Myths enthralled me. I've never forgotten reading how Loki lured Baldur's blind brother to take part in a game, assailing Baldur the Beautiful with every weapon, and loaded his bow with an arrow made of mistletoe, the only material in the universe that was fatal to the god. You all know this story. I still don't know what such a myth means or why it exercises such power. Inadvertent wrongdoing lies at the heart of this story, as well as many other compelling elements. When I put away childish things, myths and fairy tales were among them, but I was still drawn to them, and I began wanting to understand why. Why the mythic had the power to fill the mind with convincing, affecting images and bite deeper into lasting memory than other forms of communication and expression. I came across Roland Barthes' essays in his collection Mythologies when I was writing my study of the cult of the Virgin Mary. And I remember that I began browsing it in the, work, in the bookshop. And what Barthes was saying struck me to the core of my being with that force of pure recognition that the sweetest tales deliver. Myth turns history into nature. This is what I had been intuiting, that the figure of the Virgin Mother established a constructed social ideal norm for women and presented it as necessarily and eternally given. In the 70s, I set about deconstructing the forms myth takes, but I soon found that unpicking these richly layered stories has at least two shortcomings. It cannot explain away the straightforward human need for imaginative responses to the perplexities of reality. Homo narans, mulia narans, are not nourished if the stories are swept away. However much what is called reason resists the snares of myth. Secondly, and this is more important. The lessons of history, and especially of 20th century history, are that myth is always being made and remade to serve the interests of a group. And uh, Roy Foster's paper showed that all, all extraordinarily clearly, as did Tamim's. In the 80s, I decided that it was crucial not to leave the territory of the imagination 
to those history has taught us to recognize as dangerous. I couldn't know that I was on the right path. We can't tell what will happen. But weaving counter-myths and listening to the voices of the makers of stories that do not speak the language of injustice and intolerance, tuning in to the imagination and memories of our forerunners, these are, it seems to me, acts of stewardship at the heart of culture. We live in the stories we pass on and the stories we invent and how they report on experience. One of the territories which needs to be reoccupied is narrative. While enlightened and post-enlightenment anxiety about myths was justified in that myths are indeed the instruments of ideology and have indeed been told by the powerful to oppress the, um, uh, to oppress the less powerful, now is the time to regain that ground and weave alternative versions, counter-narratives. Books, the bearers of stories, and writers and storytellers, the Hakawati, the Rawi, the Rawati, the Rhapsodes, the bearers of words, can build shelters and sanctuaries and bridges. And thirdly, since I became ever more deeply immersed in thinking about huge, mysterious mythological works, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the stories of the Trojan War, the Arabian Nights, the Norse sagas, the supernatural forces in these narratives, personified as gods, fairies, jinn, seemed more and more to embody the power that the stories themselves possess to determine destiny. Not only the destiny of the characters subject to magic inside the story, but our fates too, the fates of the story's receivers. The language in which the stories are told has an effect. And I'm quoting now. For we are wagering here that thinking never has done with the conjuring impulse. And that, oddly enough, which doesn't sound like um, um, anyone particularly contemporary to do with conjuring, is uh, Jacques Derrida. A story can move across time as well as space. Its motion can be transcultural and multilingual. Abdel Fattah Kilito, the uh, Moroccan scholar, in a fable called simply Metaphor, evokes an orphaned she-camel wandering here and there, taking up residence in different cultures adopted by different groups. This is the Arabic ode, he writes. But I think we can imagine her to be a story too. Animals also propagate flora, carrying the spores and seeds in their fur or on their hooves. Mobile narratives are like seed pods packed with story spores, story burrs, story seeds, which are apt to break open and scatter, carried by different vehicles, media and bearers. It's not always easy to know how a story becomes mobile, or indeed to locate the moment when its life as an autonomous traveling text begins. But this mobility and polymorphousness are distinguishing features of myth and fairy tale. The story of Joseph in Egypt, of Abraham or the Virgin Mary, attested by the Bible and the Quran. The Cinderella figure has some very well-known domiciles in the collections of Charles Perrault and the Grimm brothers. Hamlet is the most famous from Shakespeare's tragedy, but his story has antecedents and the play has deep affinities with the Greek myth of Orestes. Strong examples of such mythic she-camels, actually more like a whole caravan of traveling texts, are of course the Thousand and One Nights and the cycle of stories about the Trojan War. The question of time is crucial. The story in motion, while tied to a particular place and to particular events which took place then in Thebes, sorry, is tied to a particular place and to particular events which took place then in Thebes, Baghdad, Troy, Carthage, and Cordova. We heard that from Wen Chin, once upon a time. But it is in the very nature of such stories that the past becomes present and has implications for the future, that within the demarcated place of the story, be it told on the page or on some kind of stage, the events that are reenacted and revisioned are four tokens. The story in motion brings news of what might be. And in this way, the stories announce ways of connecting to immediate experiences. Stories are a form of action, wrote Hannah Arendt, the way we insert ourselves into the human world. And that, later she wrote, the ability to produce stories is the way we become historical. Now, Joan Scott quoted these words when she was speaking in the symposium for Natalie Zeman Davis, one of my 
pre um, predecessors in this position. And it gives me great satisfaction to continue weaving connections with these much loved and admired forerunners, as connecting to the past seems to me to be a way of being at home. The word home rings with further meanings related but not identical. A house is not a home, according to the proverb, since when Odysseus feels his nostos, his homesickness, he longs for all of what Ithaca means to him, and the epic makes clear, including his dog. The Ithaca that is his hearth is his home on the one hand, but the place also has an imaginary mooring for his sense of himself as fashioned over time. The term homeland, which you've actually heard quite often this morning, um, is dated to 1627 by the OED, and there appears in the figurative sense of heaven, heaven, the heaven to we go to. But home is not only the domestic address, it's a larger concept of country, birthplace, and culture. And in its expanded form, homeland, the term has gained currency in the aftermath of 9-11, when the US named its internal intelligence operations the Office of Homeland Security. Its activities in turn inspired the extremely successful television series, Homeland, an intense, gripping, labyrinthine study in patriotic paranoia. The imperative to exclude therefore hangs around the concept of home in political and public discourse, while concurrently culture is busily at work, unconsciously for the most part, weaving the imagined communities in the celebrated phrase of Benedict Anderson. This leads to thinking about the possibilities of tale spinning and narrative. According to this freshly vivid concept of homeland, displaced peoples and persons lie outside the homeland of others which they are attempting to enter. The boats of the suppliants, the refugees, the migrants are the most desolating symbols of homelessness for us now. In a suggestive play on words, the geographer Marcus Dole contrasts hallowed ground with hollowed ground. Hollowed ground is drained of meaning by violence done to it by history's erasures. Hallowed ground, by contrast, is filled with meanings that have been infused into it by tradition, ritual, memory, and imagination. The Libyan writer Ibrahim al Kuni speaks of vagabond homelands in his book New War, or as W-A-W, not W-A-R, War, which is the name of an imaginary city, um, Saharan Oasis, a mystical and poetical work of fiction which has just been published in English translation. Vagabond homelands, the lovely phrase refers directly to the nomadic habitats of the Tuareg, and Alconi's mother tongue is actually Tamashek, and he translates himself into Arabic for his fiction and his meditations on the culture of the Sahara. He hasn't lived there for decades. He left for Moscow and the Gorky Institute in the 60s and worked as a journalist since, and he now lives in Spain. But he's become a cosmopolitan intellectual, keeping the memory of his people and their culture in copious poetic and intense writings and transmuting them into a universal myth, ecological and apocalyptic, about the endangered world. The nomadism he knows makes him cherish the archive that he is both keeping and inventing, and welcoming its passage into other languages. He welcomes its passage into other languages where the memory of it will survive. So he has, for example, compiled a beautiful volume of Tuareg aphorisms, translated by Roger Allen, who is a virtuoso of Arabic translation. And he reports on the way of life of the shy Tuareg, whose men are veiled and who are solitary wanderers in the Sahara, keeping away even from oases as if they were dangerous and corrupt urban centers. Alconi's writing truly discloses a world and a way of life almost totally unknown and offers a reflection on the condition of culture more den generally. One of the aphorisms he's collected, or perhaps invented, we don't know, is the homeland is a phoenix, for its body is in the sultan's hands, but its spirit lives in the poet's heart, handing over the responsibility, as it were, to the writer. The hollowed ground is drained of meaning. Sorry. But these way ways of, sorry. Home is also a sanctuary, and the symbolic processes that define it belong to the language of making sacred or holy hallowing, as the root in the English of the word sanctuary reveals. And those processes, which can be secular as well as religious rituals, are multifarious in history and in different societies' practices. Making literature plays a crucial part in this process of establishing sanctuary. The cartographies of longing across place, 
are as much a part of storytelling as the chronicle through time. But these ways of mapping of the, of the common ground don't necessarily have to be historical or remembered by heart by individuals from a corpus in the past. They are effective also when they are fabricated, which is where the work of fiction plays such a part, and I could add poetry, um, narrative in poetry too, plays such a part in ways of dwelling. The map is not the territory. This is a pungent phrase coined in 1931 by Alfred Kozybiski. Um, and it, what it means is the map does not chart the territory as it is experienced by an individual or a community. Korzybiski was talking in terms of neurolinguistics and pointing out how our perceptions and beliefs as individuals and members of a society gathered over time form our reality. They constitute the territory as we live it, whatever its actual objective reality, if one can ever find that. But this mode of reattaching oneself to a place that is not home but must become one does not necessarily depend on transmitting an existing story, nor on inheriting one through historical or geographical bonds. The mobile story twists and turns, changes and strikes out in a new direction, offering itself to passers-by, to exiles, to migrants, willing and unwilling. And from these retrievals, a new plot can be struck. The poet Ottavio Paz writes about the prospective actions of memory work in a poem about remembrance and loss. I am a history, a memory inventing itself. I am never alone. I plant signs. Planting signs metaphorically evokes the activity of the writer and or artist who, while recording history, is also making it up, memory inventing itself. This memory bearer does not chronicle events or transcribe an epiphany or report an experience inner or outer, though the work may claim to be any one of those things or all of them. The writer also plants signs. What does Paz mean? I think he means that a narrator knots into the fabric of the story, the text, the woven thing, a series of riddles, figures in the carpet, which await the scryer or interpreter to feel out later and tease out for the fullest implications. The text becomes a palimpsest, or a polyphonic piece of music, which can be understood differently. Paz's first person of the poet places too much emphasis on the deliberate acts of the writer, for mobile stories are living things, and the signs they give are cryptic, allowing for receivers to read or interpret in a fluid variety of meanings. They grow far beyond what their creator planted. Indeed, the process of transmission shouldn't be seen as a form of colonialist cartography. While it involves a figural layering of imaginary experiences onto the ground of the lived life, planting signs, such a way of being in the world does not obliterate, but aims to enrich. Ours is a country of words, wrote Darwish, the subject of Wen Chin's paper, in a poem that speaks to all people who are on the move, displaced from their homes for reasons of war, persecution, and necessity. The poem draws, in a mingled draws on the mingled languages and cultures of the Eastern Mediterranean and its multi-layered memories. We travel like everyone else, but we return to nothing, as if travel were a path of clouds. We travel in the chariots of the Psalms, sleep in the tents of the prophets, and are born again in the language of the gypsies. We measure space with a hoopoo's beak and sing so that distance may forget us. Ours is a country of words. Talk, talk. Let me see an end to this journey. The hoopoo's beak, interestingly enough, alludes to the talking bird messenger of Solomon, who brings with him, the bird brings with him news of the Queen of Sheba, among other things, in the fabulous cycle of myths around the figure of Solomon, a figure in all three of the Abrahamic religions. Ways of dwelling imply ways of telling. The poet Murid Barghouti, in I was born there, I was born here, his memoir of a return to Palestine with Tamim, um, writes, the worst thing about wars is that they reduce the enemy to a single characteristic. The country ceases to be history, language, architecture, theater, gardens and legends, a heritage of love stories, philosophy and science, shared ancestral dreams and uncountable versions of human striving along the road of the universe. Instead, every country becomes a mere label, 
blot, field of battle. The whole of history is now today, and today has become a reduction of every yesterday that has passed over the face of the earth, a reduction of all history. The United Nations has started to respond to the immaterial needs of displaced peoples, that cultural heritage, connectedness, and belonging established through memory and imagination. And this might all be a human right, and it's become the new frontier of human rights thinking. Such compass points are formed often not by material goods, but by immaterial artifacts, by words spoken, recited, performed, sung, and remembered. They may be preserved in books, but they also travel by other ethereal conduits, especially in the age of the internet, when they are at one and the same time vigorous and fragile. They may inhere in things, containers of memories and history. In 2003, UNESCO declared protection for intangible cultural heritage, but the dominant implication was that this applied principally to the cultures of unlettered peoples, to oratory, oral literature. And this, in my view, needs adjusting. Highly literate civilizations also flourish through oral culture, performed, played, channels of transmission. Cultural and literary transmission of myth and story as a process of constant, is in a process of constant, deep, and fruitful metamorphosis. And these metamorphoses take place in dialogue with written texts, but are not constrained by writing. Indeed, mobile narratives are a dynamic feature of contemporary culture because the internet and digital technologies have opened up a vast arena for varieties of performance, recitation, speech, combining sound, image, and voice. The traffic in mobile myths is rising with the strong and omnipresent return of acoustics to communication. We have entered a hybrid era in which the oral is no longer placed in opposition to the literate. When Borges com commented that he had always imagined paradise will be a kind of library, it's interesting to remember that the great writer was himself blind for the greater part of his life, and he was read to. Books for him were sounded. So let's now turn to those two cities of myth, Troy and Carthage, which have inspired multiple stories crystallized in epic poetry and tragedies of antiquity, but efflorescing into other artifacts with autonomous energy ever since. And through these vast, this vast array of works, I want to look in particular at two forms of mythic speech, the language of blessing and the language of cursing. Both are central dynamics of mythic storytelling. Their mood is optative, and they both involve prolepsis. They look forward, wishing for something to take place. Dido, Queen of Carthage, casts her mind forward and imagines a future of torment for Aeneas and endless enmity between Rome and Carthage. Virgil, writing the epic, is of course in a privileged position to know what happened in the Punic Wars, that Carthage, Rome's ancient rival in North Africa for the control of the Mediterranean, had been laid waste. In the imaginative act of telling the story, the writer casts himself or herself as Cassandra, a prophet who alone knows what is to come. But by the time the story is being told, it has already happened, and any predictions have the benefit of hindsight and have come true. Euripides knows that Troy has fallen when he dramatizes Cassandra's grief-stricken warnings and her fellow citizens' fateful oblivion. Beyond the rings of ripples encircling the characters and their narrat narrators, mythic stories set yet another ring of foreknowledge rippling. We, readers or listeners, are likely to know the story too. And frequently, the prophetic curse or blessing we are reading or hearing can shiver with truth-telling power in evident relation to the past and consequently and more powerfully still setting up reverberations in the present. Not long before he died, Edward Said wrote the introduction to the 50th anniversary edition of Mimesis, Eric Auerbach's landmark study of representation in Western literature. Said refers there to a long and complex essay that Auerbach wrote called Figura. Figura signifies a pattern within a text, a kind of figure in the carpet that is not immediately visible, but structurally present in a form that enriches and directs the significance of the whole. Auerbach set up a contrast between Odysseus and Abraham, writes Said. This is a quote now from Said. The former Abraham, sorry, the former Odysseus is immediately present and requires no interpretation, no recourse either to allegory or to complicated explanations. Diametrically opposed is the figure of Abraham, 
who incarnates doctrine and promise and is steeped in them. For that very reason, they are fraught with background and are mysterious, containing a second concealed meaning. And this second meaning can only be recovered by a very particular act of interpretation, figural interpretation. The apparent meaning conceals another, as in that famous French warning on level crossings, un train peut en cacher un autre, one train can hide another, don't cross. <laughs> the, the figure stands and moves in the present moment of the text under one's eyes, but the latent meanings emerge both in the past and look forward to the future. The narrowly averted sacrifice of Isaac prefigures the death of Jesus. And, and um, Said comments, how much more fulfilling is the new idea that pre-Christian times can be read as a shadowy figure, figura, of what was actually to come. Mythic material offers the possibility of this kind of figural palimpsest, and remapping Troy onto familiar ground in the present has become a way of telling the history of today's wars. The Cure at Troy, Seamus Heaney's version of Philoctetes, was written in 1961, and it courageously encrypted the troubles of his homeland without wrenching Sophocles out of true. Many writers have followed in the wake of Heaney, not least his fellow poets, close friends and allies, Derek Walcott with Omeros, 1990, and Ted Hughes with Tales from Ovid, 1997. Since then, and the continuing growing wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, the responses of writers to the matter of Troy keep coming. The genealogy of these mythic reinscriptions is long and tangled, far too long to give here. But I'll just mention David Malouf's Ransom, a spare, eloquent novel published in 2010, which returns to the scene at the end of the Iliad, when Priam abases himself before Achilles to plead for the return of Hector's body, horribly and implacably violated by the Greek hero who's killed him. Two more are fierce distillations of multiple sources, such as the blazing prose poem Achilles by Elizabeth Cook from 2003, while in 2010, the lost books of the Odyssey by Zachary Mason postulated different possibilities for the Greek hero in a dazzling Calvino-esque sequence. These fictions, each of them unusual and remarkable in their own way, all slant their perceptions through the shared matter of Troy and revisit the long ago siege in Asia Minor in order to think about the conflicts we are engaged in now. That territory is so often far off in time, that remote place of Bronze Age civilization becomes a map of hostilities at home, and the process of revisioning requires a double act of folding, folding the geographical map onto present circumstances of place and displacement, and folding one time zone against another, so that the events then become our now, and the prophetic temporality of myth becomes active. Our contemporary war zones lie so geographically close to the compass bearings of the Trojan War and its long aftermath that contemporary acts of memory and imagination don't superimpose a different set of coordinates on the map, but return to the same physical territory and redraw its landmarks. The names are all familiar, just as the names of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan echo, sorry, just as the wars in, in Iran and if Iraq and Afghanistan echo with the cities and harbors of the Arabian Nights. The cities of Troy and Carthage are tightly linked because Virgil's Aeneid focuses on a Trojan hero who tells the story of his tragic city to Dido and enthralls her with his words, moving her to pity and to passionate love for the teller in a scene that captures vividly the intrinsic power of narrative. And Virgil returns again and again to the profound effect that the telling of a tale in words and in images can have on the listener or the viewer. He also minds the power of repetition, elaboration, and reenactment. The passion of Dido for Aeneas and her loss of self that it brings about in Virgil has an ultimate cause in narrative itself, it could be said, rather than in Aeneas's character as he interacts with her in propria persona. Of course, the capricious and tyrannical gods drive on the tragedy, but the immediate catalyst is story, told and retold by one voice after another through one medium and another, adding to the luster and seduction of both protagonists. First, Venus, goddess of love, evokes Dido's magnificence and autonomy in order to fire Aeneas' curiosity and his desire. Then Aeneas relives his own ordeals in the last days of Troy in the frieze on Dido's temple. <laughs> 
and extended ekphrasis which animates the sculptures as if they were cinematically embodied. These recountings lead in the same way as an overture prepares the audience for the full development of the motifs and melodies to Dido's invitation to Aeneas. Wait, come my guest, tell us your own story, start to finish. And he does so. He tells his own odyssey in Virgil's version, unlike, and unlike his prefiguring Greek hero, um, sorry, he tells his own version, his own story in, his, in Virgil's version, unlike his prefiguring Greek hero Odysseus, who listened to his own story recited by the bard Demodocus in the Odyssey. But when Aeneid reaches the close, after nearly 2,000 lines of verse, he fell silent now, his tale complete, at rest. The spent catharsis of this cadence, almost sexual in its sense of plenitude, immediately strikes the unappeased, seething turmoil in the queen as book four opens with the lines. But the queen, too long she has suffered the pain of love, hour by hour nursing the wound with her lifeblood, consumed by the fires buried in her heart. Virgil and Venus have introduced and will introduce other catalysts to kindle her fiery passion for Aeneas, but the narrative of his past sufferings has set the seal on her fate. Destiny changed by the power of story, especially spoken by a witness who was there, figures so vividly in Virgil's dramatic technique that it inspired stories and revisionings which recognize the overwhelming effects of a work of literature recited or performed. And this acknowledgement of the power of words to mold minds and sway feelings has more importance than a simple affirmation of literary creation. It can alert us to the way fictions interact with experience, leading responses that in themselves then shape cognitive understanding and consequently values. An anecdote from a life of Virgil, written as part of a commentary on his works by the third century grammarian Donatus, became a celebrated trope in paintings, especially in the neoclassical, um, by the, in the neoclassical art during Napoleon's reign and afterwards. And Donatus tells the emperor, emperor Augustus, Sorry, Donatus tells us that the Emperor Augustus was eager to read the Aeneid. Indeed, Augustus jokingly entreated the poet in his letters with threats as well as prayers that you send me your first sketch of the Aeneid. Later, Donatus relates that Virgil did read from his epic to the Emperor, his wife, Livia, and his sister, Octavia. And in Book 6, Aeneas makes the descent into the underworld, accompanied by the Sibyl, and he meets the ghost of his father, Anchises, <coughs> who then unfurls for him a vast vision of the future, showing him the lineage of their family stretching all the way to a young boy, Marcellus. There, the prophetic vision breaks off with a cry of grief. O oh, child of heartbreak, if only you could burst the stern decrees of fate, you will be Marcellus. Fill my arms with lilies, let me scatter flowers, lustrous roses piling high these gifts at least, on our descendants' shade and perform a futile rite. Marcellus was Augustus' nephew, the son of his sister Octavia, and he was generally expected to inherit the imperial mantle of the dynasty that Virgil was consecrating in his epic, which traced itself all the way back mythically to Aeneas' son. But his future descendant, Marcellus, had died young in 23 BC. And Donatus tells us that when Virgil read the words to Eris Marcellus, Octavia, his mother, fainted. She had come face to face in the poem with the prophesied death of her only son. So that's a recognition scene. Significantly, the scene of storytelling renders participants deeply susceptible, strips them of their defenses, makes them subjects of a form of imaginative hypnosis. Shakespeare gives the motif a specifically theatrical spin when the player king in Hamlet recites a scene from the fall of Troy about the death of Priam and weeps with emotion as he acts at his own performance, provoking Hamlet to rail against his own inability to move or be moved. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? The influence of that central human activity of telling and retelling stories, the récit, both fabricated and testimony, uh, shouldn't be underestimated, and Shakespeare certainly didn't. The love story of Aeneas and Dido in Virgil's epic climaxes with Dido's death on a funeral pyre and her ferocious curse on Aeneas and all his descendants. 
It's a monumental and for historic hate speech filled with chilling foreknowledge. Prolepsis becomes the stance of a story when it comes to a shared myth. So when it comes from a shared myth like the story of Troy, and with Dido's curse on Aeneas and his posterity as she prepares to kill herself, Virgil uses history to utter a thrilling and terrifying prophecy. And you, my Tyrians, harry with hatred all his line, his race to come. Make that offering to my ashes, send it down below. No love between our peoples ever, no pacts of peace. Come rising up from my bones, you avenger still unknown, to stalk those Trojan settlers, hunt with fire and iron, now or in time to come, whenever the power is yours. Shore clash with shore, sea against sea, and sword against sword. This is my curse. War between all our peoples, all their children. Endless war. This is Robert Fagel's translation. For every generation that hears those lines from Virgil's poem, or happens now, rather more often, ferociously vo voiced by Dido's on screen or stage, the ringing words seem to foresee contemporaneous conflicts. When Hector Berlioz composed the soaring climax of Les Troyens in the mid-19th century, Carthage swearing vengeance against Rome for her humiliation seemed to express the defeat of the Maghreb by French colonial ambitions. In the decade before Berlioz was creating Les Troyens, thousands of Frenchmen and women were expatriated to Algeria to settle the colony at the government's policy, as government's policy their dreams stoked by false promises of unoccupied territory and future riches, only to find themselves planted among hostile inhabitants and all the subsequent troubles that followed. In Le Premier Homme, the first man, Albert Camus' unfinished and posthumously published autobiography, the Algerian-born writer described his grandparents' emigration from France, towed downriver to Marseille, where they embarked for their new world. Camus' memoir is bitter about the poverty and illiteracy of his family. And the question the colonial enterprise raised runs through his own approach to the classics in his dramas and his political thinking. Concepts of Africa, and especially of the Maghreb or North Africa, are no more monolingual or monolithic than concepts of other countries and their cultures. But Virgil's mythic creation, for many reasons, has overshadowed um, the counter-narratives, and created an imaginary map that only partially reflects the territory, its history, and its culture. One can't expect much more from a single writer, of course, but mythic works tend, as Barth pointed out, to fix their subjects in an eternal set of meanings. Virgil set out consciously to inscribe his emperor and the Roman Empire into an ancient myth, and he succeeded all too splendidly with lasting effects into Mussolini's fascist vision. But Virgil could not have known how his epic would also institute a potentially imaginary cultural split between the West and the non-West in the future, and the historical connections between the cultures of the Maghreb and Asia Minor, taking place long after Virgil had died, would still fall under the shadow of the curse that his poem had pronounced. Blessing is the opposite of cursing, and also its antidote which can't undo the venom. And such speech acts also seek to avert harm by anticipating it. When you feel you need to say to someone setting out on a journey, go safely or Godspeed, the phrases have no sense except as a charm. Pardon, one underlying motive in the desire for blessing, can be charted on a windrose that points also to apology, confession, blazon, rhapsody, greeting, entreaty, praise song, elegy, and eulogy good speech, an eulogy possibly representing the larger term for this section of the rhetorical compass, fair words, beatitudes. These are some of the great ancient varieties of speaking fair, and they fill some of the earliest literature that has survived, the, the scriptures of all the major faiths. And the dark reverse of blessing shows through these ways of speaking their inseparable shadow, diatribe, cursing, ironic eulogy or invective, the curse is blessing's furious twin. Blessings also seek to placate, as in the proverb, a soft answer turneth away wrath, and to cleanse a pollution. In, the relation, in relation to the theme of myth, however, soft answers need not take the form of gentle words. Several contemporary responses to the fall of Troy communicate mercy, pity, despair, and a hunger for justice through scenes of carnage and cruelty inspired directly by the Iliad and its afterlives. <coughs> 
ever since the Greek tragedies, reimaginings of the fall of Troy and the sufferings of both sides, but above all of the vanquished, have provided a mental site of reflection and metaphor where the language of propitiation and the warnings of prolepsis flourish. Poetry, song, story, the imaginative representatives, uh, representations of art aren't necessarily vehicles of sweetness and light. Past evils can and must be remembered, and they need, and need to be so as warnings, even when they are being averted by the power of fair words, the bread of faithful speech. Blessing comes from a very old word, proto-Germanic, according to the dictionary, for blood offering, and it was chosen to translate the Latin Bible's benedicere, to speak well or say well, the word taking color mistakenly from bliss. The term benediction now has an entirely clerical ring in English, but, and isn't much used outside scholarship, really. But However, speaking ill has been encoded in law for some time now as hate speech. The force of injurious words doesn't need legal definition to be understood emotionally, and upholders of freedom of speech object to such laws giving protection to certain groups. But I'm invoking them here to draw attention to the widespread acceptance that saying ill is efficacious and needs to be constrained and that its power derives from the words themselves and not from some higher or infernal power. Race hatred does not need the devil as agent. The act of its utterance by anyone constitutes the harm. Blessing, too, can also take place without supernatural guarantees. During the scene at the end of King Lear, when Cordelia is found hanged and her body brought on stage and laid before her father, Lear's lament rises and falling, falls while a turmoil of action swirls around him. His words move from grief-stricken recognition of her death to a series of exclamations, protests, refusals, rhetorical questions, ejaculations, commands, a whole gamut of what Beckett calls vociferations, the howl of the wounded and disempowered creature before the horror of loss and death. This bleak conclusion, abolishing hope, produced, proved too much for some early producers, and the tragedy was rewritten as fairy tale with Cordelia resurrected and the pair of them embarked on a harmonious life together. The repentant Lear paints a proleptic picture of their idyll. We two alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and take upon us the mystery of things as if we were God's spies. When Lear says that when Cordelia asks for his blessing, he'll kneel down and ask for forgiveness, his words chime for me with the aim of old tales about the mystery of things, to use Lear's words, like the tales of the Thousand and One Nights, that are passed on to ward off danger. Shahrazad is telling stories to keep alive and to save all women from the rage of the Sultan. She's the heroine of a ransom tale, and many of her stories are also ransom tales. The practice of blessing the living and the dead corresponds to the drive of literature and art to illuminate and protect by remembering, by exposing what has happened, and by rep reproducing what might happen in order to conjure it, for the telling of it, to bring about good, to forestall harm. It's homeopathy by the word, and you don't have to have faith or belong to a church to believe in such verbal agency. This is the one of the many areas where magical thinking survives and can't be extinguished. It's bound up with the way our faculties work and language conveys consciousness. Thank you. <laughs>